Mindfulness is active, deliberate awareness. It means paying attention and paying attention in a particular way. It's paying attention in the present moment or to the present moment. Much of the time we're thinking about past or future. We're not really paying attention to the here and now. So we're not actually being mindful. Mindfulness means paying attention with openness and kindness. Mindfulness is non-reactive. So that means we're just taking in whatever is there to be aware of, whatever is happening, without either pushing away or rejecting what we don't like, or grasping after what we do like, but just with an attitude that is gently appreciative, both of ourselves and the world around us. So that's it. That's what mindfulness is. You can practice it in just about any context of life, such as doing the washing up, although in some contexts it's inherently more difficult to be mindful than others. That's not to say that you have to be mindful all the time. I personally don't believe that. I think daydreaming can actually be quite good for you at times. And you can practice mindfulness more formally in a context of formal meditation, where you're essentially not doing anything else but being aware, focusing on the present moment. So it's sort of easy enough to say what mindfulness is, even quite succinctly, but it's also quite easy to miss the point, especially before you've actually practiced it. There's a lot more that could be said. This bare definition doesn't necessarily convey the spirit of mindfulness. As I said earlier, mindfulness first developed in the Buddhist traditions of ancient India, and the Buddhist scriptures give us a number of metaphors for mindfulness, which I think give us a sense of that spirit. So here's one. Being mindful is like walking with a bowl filled to the brim with oil balanced on your head. Moving with smoothness, grace and precision, not a drop is spilt. So this metaphor emphasises the balancing influence of mindfulness. Another one. Mindfulness practice is like climbing a tower, enabling you to see a long way. With mindfulness we gain perspective, clear-sightedness and perhaps detachment. Mindfulness is like a strong post to which a wild animal is chained. The wild animal is the unruly mind. This metaphor emphasises the stabilising influence of mindfulness. There's a variation of this one from the Tibetan tradition that I think is really useful. This story says that it's best to tether a wild horse with a long rope. Then the animal still has some freedom, plenty of space to move about in, so it doesn't feel quite so constrained. As it gets used to captivity, the rope can be shortened. I think this image says something about the need for balanced effort, not being too willful or over controlling, but at the same time still applying the mind, not being too lax. Mindfulness is not the same as daydreaming. Mindfulness is a form of mind training. It evolved in Buddhism as a tool for training the mind, for transforming the mind. And as such, it aims to develop certain qualities of mind. So what qualities of mind? Well, in a sense, this is up to you. There are numerous positive qualities of mind, and you can focus on whatever is most appealing to you. But traditionally, it's things such as stillness and calmness, the opposite of the kind of busy racing mind that's so common in today's world. And related to that, clarity, also focus, a focus that is stable and malleable. Peace, contentment, and emotional positivity. For example, we want the mind to be loving and appreciative. Also energy and vitality. Flow states are experienced in the context of challenging activities, such as playing sports or music or arts. Challenging enough that your full attention is engaged. Nothing is left over to wonder what you're going to have to eat later on or whatever. So you're absorbed or immersed to the point that you don't have to try. The experience just flows effortlessly. So flow states are wonderful. They're part of what we live for and we want to experience flow as much as possible. So naturally, we'd like mindfulness practice to have something of the quality of flow. That's not to say that mindfulness is purely about flow. An obvious point of divergence is that mindfulness involves deliberate self-conscious awareness, which is not there in flow states. But taking a broader perspective, we can go beyond this apparent difference. 
First we need to appreciate that all flow states arise out of effort and application, perhaps even struggle. We don't just spontaneously pop into flow, we in some sense have to work up to it. And at the same time, mindfulness meditation practice can develop into absorption. In the Buddhist tradition, meditative states of absorption are called dhyana. Dhyana is in some sense a higher state of conscious, and our normal sense of self-consciousness or separateness is at least attenuated in some way. So I think it's very legitimate to ask, how can we make mindfulness practice more flow-like? How can we access flow in mindfulness practice? Let's build on something I said earlier, which was that flow doesn't just emerge spontaneously, but arises in dependence on preconditions, including effort and application. The nature of these preconditions is a really interesting area of inquiry, not just for us, but in psychology research. A number of conditions for flow have been identified. Here I want to focus on the main preconditions. These are actually inherent in the original work on flow states by Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi. Remember, flow arises in the context of activity, where your mind is engaged, it's doing something. And flow depends on the nature of the activity as much as anything. So the first precondition is, the activity has to have clear goals or outcomes. So in tennis, the goal is to hit the ball over the net and into the court. That's the first goal. If you're playing guitar, the goal is to produce a tune that sounds good, that sounds right, having the right notes in the right order. Perhaps it's also to keep pace with other players if you're playing in a band. Second, there needs to be direct and immediate feedback on your progress towards these goals. In both my examples, tennis and guitar, you have this. It's immediately clear when you've played a successful shot or a note, and also clear when you made a mistake. If you do make a mistake, it's usually pretty clear exactly what you did wrong and what you need to do better next time. Third, you need the right level of challenge. If the activity is too easy, you get bored. If it's too difficult, you get stressed. Biofeedback and mindfulness can mutually support each other. Although at first sight they might seem incompatible, because biofeedback is goal-focused, while mindfulness isn't really, I think this is a superficial view because they have overlapping underlying purposes. They're both forms of mind training. They both aim to develop certain qualities of mind. We've seen that mindfulness supports biofeedback practice by adding what I've been calling the mindfulness mindset, which we need to avoid the quicksand trap of trying too hard and over controlling. Just to recap, the mindfulness mindset is the rather paradoxical attitude of holding to a purpose, yet at the same time attaching no importance to it, as though it were all just a game. It's a way of not trying, but just doing. And conversely, biofeedback can support mindfulness by essentially strengthening the three major preconditions of flow that I've been talking about. There's much more to say about how it does that, but I'm going to defer that until later in the course.